Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Pete Nyquist, Chair of the Environmental Practice Group here at Greenberg Glesker, where our team provides a broad range of environmental litigation, regulatory and compliance counseling, transactional support to a broad range of industries. That includes clients in the commercial real estate marketplace. Our work encompasses each of the substantive areas that we'll be talking about today. So as a preliminary matter, uh, I would like to apologize for the last minute rescheduling of last week's program. Um, it was due to a, a family medical situation. Everything is fine now, but uh, I'm sorry for any disruption to your busy calendars. And I just wanted to mention a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, as I mentioned, for the early arrivers, a link to obtain CLE credit for the lawyers in attendance today will be distributed via link, has been distributed via link um, during the program, and will also be uh, following up with uh, an email to all attendees. And finally, uh, I will try to reserve some time for questions, which you can um, submit via the, the Q&A prompt, um, but we'll defer them until the end of the presentation. There's a lot, lot of content to get through today, so if we don't have time to respond to, to your specific question, feel free to follow up and we'll do our best to address it. So without uh, further ado, so today we'll be addressing the new uh, phase one ASTM um, standard for phase one environmental site assessment reports. Um, there's a new law applicable to local agency or COOPA oversight of investigation and cleanup sites updated DTSC vapor intrusion guidelines and some, some evolving uh, developments in that area. Um, PFAS or forever chemicals, much is happening at both the federal level and here in California. And then briefly, we'll, we'll touch on recent updates to the statewide general construction permit and a, and a couple comments on um, some CEQA developments. Um, so given our format today, this presentation uh, will by design try to try to provide topical information, but we'll certainly not cover all essential details. There's there's a lot to unpack here. I know many of you in attendance today are yourselves experts in one or more of the, the subject areas. So my goal today is to provide a summary of key developments that are uh, that are of particular relevance to the commercial, um, marketplace, property owners, and developers. Um, so let's first turn attention to recent revisions to the phase one environmental standards. So just a quick primer on, on how a phase one report fits into the bigger diligence picture. Um, it, it goes without saying that any prospective buyer of commercial property in urban California and in particular developers of mixed use or residential projects need to understand the environmental condition of, of the property that they're acquiring or evaluating. So for example, in the Los Angeles urban core, it's extremely rare for a sizable infill property to not be impacted with at least some observable levels of chlorinated solvents or, or petroleum compounds, at least in soil vapor, and that's whether from historic on-site uh, uses or adjacent property uses. Um, as you know, there's many sources of information that can be relevant to the evaluation of potential environmental risk. That includes publicly available databases, uh, government record repositories, and that's in addition to um, site-specific materials that would be furnished by a, a prospective seller or lesser. So a phase one environmental site assessment is but one piece of the environmental diligence process, albeit a very important one. One area of, of critical concern for prospective buyers or lessees of environmentally impaired property is the potential liability imposed against any current owner or operator under the federal surplus statute, also referred to as the Superfund law. In order to help facilitate the sale and transfer of such properties, Congress 
uh, amended the original CERCLA statute to confer potential defenses to liability of certain classes of persons. And that includes um, BFPPs or bona fide prospective purchasers, provided that they could demonstrate one, having engaged in an appropriate level of due diligence prior to acquisition, that's referred to as, as all appropriate inquiries or AII, and then two, showing reasonable care in the management of any identified environmental conditions post-acquisition. As noted in the slide, AAI is defined in the CERCLA statute and construed by EPA, um, as construed by EPA, provides the basis for a phase one environmental site assessment. So all phase one reports since 2013 have been done in conformance with the existing ASTM standard 1527-13. Earlier this year, EPA announced final revisions to the standard that had been in development since 2021, and its intention to recognize both the older standard and the newer standard as satisfying AAI. Um, however, based on um, substantial comments that um, took issue with continued recognition of the older standard, EPA withdrew that, that rule in May of, of last year. Um, so moving ahead to November, EPA reissued a final rule, which provides that only the newer standard should be used going forward. But um, they, they made an exception and are allowing users up to a year after the effective date of February 13th of 2024 to become familiar with and actually start using the newer 1527-21 standard. So a couple things to note. While a phase one is not per se required, and this, this is um, based on EPA's own guidance, is not required to demonstrate compliance with AAI, um, it's certainly considered market such that we always recommend to our clients the commissioning of a phase one report with a qualified consultant if you're evaluating a prospective purchase. Um, two, while the changes under the new standard are, are really not all that dramatic, there are a number of nuances that, imp that do implicate strategic considerations as to whether you should use the prior standard or the new one for your projects between now and February of next year. And that's especially if the property at issue has, uh, has a potential PFAS profile, and we'll, uh, we'll discuss that in a, in a bit more detail. Um, later here in the presentation. So I won't go into detail on, on the specific changes, but probably most importantly, there are refinements and clarifications to the key environment, the key definitional terms um, known as RECs, CRECs, and HRECs. Um, and in light of these changes, one key practice tip, and you know, this was certainly the case before, but even more so now, it's it's really important to carefully review the findings and conclusions of your draft phase one before it's finalized. Um, for example, any report that does not expressly reference um, institutional controls, excuse me, uh, institutional controls or engineering controls when concluding an, envir an environmental condition constitutes either a CREC or HREC, uh, should be revised at, at the discretion of you, the client, or, or your counsel. So previously, under the 1527-13 standard, uh, a phase one had to be completed within 180 days of acquisition. However, this was often construed as uh, the date that the phase one report was finalized and actually signed. Uh, the new rule eliminates that flexibility and, you know, frankly, what was potential gaming of the timeline by clarifying that the 180-day clock begins to run from the first of the listed core elements that are enumerated on the slide, and that the start date for each one must be specifically identified in the report. So the goal here is to ensure that, that phase one reports are more uniformly based on relatively current information. 
So shifting now to AB 304, which establishes new requirements for local agency oversight of investigations and cleanup of environmentally impaired property. When, when our new infill or brownfield development projects are kicking off, inevitably the, the first two questions we typically get asked by our clients are how long and how much will it cost to get agency approvals, whatever that means in, in the specific context. Um, but that does include many impaired sites that will that we know will require at least some um, active remediation or vapor mitigation systems. So as a corollary, we also get asked how long to actually obtain a no further action letter. And frankly, answering these questions has become harder than ever, um, and for several reasons, which I'll explain. One, one major concern in recent years, and especially during the pandemic, is, is how resource constrained key Cal EPA agencies, such as the state and regional water boards, the department, um, and the Department of Toxic Substances Control, or DTSC, have become. They have a huge backlog of voluntary cleanup program and enforcement cases, um, and we've had several recent instances where local offices have advised they simply don't have capacity to take on uh, new cases. Um, this is hugely problematic if you are trying to timely advance a project through the maze of California regulatory and entitlement hurdles. So one, one option that many project proponents have utilized over the years is instead seeking oversight by local agencies or CUPAs, such as uh, you know, here within LA County, the, the fire department site mitigation unit is qualified to provide similar services. Um, a new law that went into effect last year, AB 304, implements a number of new requirements applicable to local agency jurisdiction of cleanup sites. Under AB 304, there are new certification requirements to ensure the qualifications of local agencies um, to, to confer them authority to provide oversight and enter into voluntary cleanup agreements uh, referred to as remedial action agreements or RAAs. However, the key change is that prior to the intake of a new cleanup site, the local agency must first provide written notification to both the local DTSC and water board office within the applicable jurisdiction and allow 30 days for them to advise whether or not they intend to assume oversight. If DTSC or the water board um, so acts, it preempts local agency oversight. Um, if they don't, the COOPA can proceed with completing the RAA process. And um, under, under the new law, all site information is to be posted to the GeoTracker statewide database. Um, that was happening on an ad hoc basis in prior years, but this is to ensure that, um, that all sites are uniformly made available to the public. There is still the potential after you initiate your RAA process with the COOPA um, for either DTSC or the Water Board to step in and assert jurisdiction if any of, of these listed determinations are made, um, which is essentially an intervention mechanism in the event that an approved remedy is deemed by either DTSC or the Water Board to be woefully inadequate. In reality, this is just a clarification of existing law or prior law, since DTSC or the Water Board have always had authority to assert jurisdiction or, or assume jurisdiction, rather, of an existing COOPA case. Um, as a practical matter, this almost never happens and will probably continue to very rarely, if ever, happen under AB 304, given the current backlog within the Cal EPA agencies. There are actually 
much bigger questions as to AB 304's new post remedial site closure requirements. Um, previously, Coopas have had broad discretion to manage and close cleanup sites on their docket based on their own application of, of state requirements. Um, now, there's a prescribed process for the Coopa to certify that cleanup objectives in the RAA were accomplished and to then provide at least 30 days advance notice to DTSC, the Water Board, um, and key affected stakeholders, along with GeoTracker posting prior to actually um, rendering a site closure determination. So this provides yet another mechanism for DTSC or the Water Board to potentially intervene in the event they determine that completed remedial measures were insufficient. Since this is um, inherently a discretionary determination, um, there, there is some concern within the regulatory community um, as to how this process could potentially become politicized and result in further delay of closure determinations and potentially even impose additional remedial requirements that would not otherwise be compelled by uh, risk assessments overseen by, by local COOPAs. So we'll see, uh, you know, relatively new law and most projects in the pipeline have not um, had to implement these uh, particular closure requirements. Okay, so next um, we will address everyone's favorite topic, um, the evil that lurks beneath, otherwise known as the, the latest and greatest with DTSC's revised vapor intrusion guidance. So um, just to recap the basics, vapor intrusion or VI focuses on concerns about hazardous substances, mainly from common chlorinated solvents like PCE and TCE, um, wafting up in vapors from subsurface sources and into um, overlying structures through pre preferential pathways like openings or cracks. Um, elevated concentrations of these chemicals in indoor air may pose health risks, including increased cancer risks, especially over prolonged exposure periods. So warning, here, here comes the nerdy part, um, which is the source of so much controversy and consternation within the regulated community. Attenuation factor. So this is actually a very simple concept. If you know the concentration of a chemical in indoor air and divide it by the known concentration of the same chemical in subsurface vapor, um, that's the attenuation factor. And indoor air concentrations would be expected to be much lower than what's in the soil because they decrease or attenuate as they migrate up through building features. Um, a confounding factor is that sampling VOCs in indoor air as a screening tool implicates many issues. And that includes um, cost and scope, potential notification and reporting obligations, and um, most practically, logistical difficulties of getting accurate indoor air readings that are not influenced by cross-contamination from other chemical products uh, within the building. So agencies have developed conservative screening values that allow for the evaluation of vapor intrusion risk for both commercial and residential structures based on observed subsurface soil vapor data without actually having to collect indoor air samples. And this has really been a critical tool for not only evaluating environmental conditions at individual properties, but in determining, <coughs> excuse me, whether or not uh, remedial or mitigation measures may be necessary based on a, a further evaluation of, of actual site-specific conditions. Um, so as noted, the, the really the crux of the problem is that 
um, despite um, compilations of, of a lot of data from California demonstrating that the approach that's been promulgated by DTSC is overly conservative, um, they have continued to um, substantially rely upon um, an attenu a default attenuation factor of 0 0.03 um, that unfortunately um, implicates a lot of sites that in reality uh, likely pose little to no risk to the environment or to, to human health. So we'll, we'll break this down a little bit here. This slide provides a timeline of how vapor guidance has been evolving for over 10 years and, and long before that. The key takeaways here are that under prior state guidance, the default attenuation factor was 0 0.001 for commercial properties and 0 0.002 for residential properties. That changed after in, in 2015 and after when US EPA published new guidance proposing the more conservative uh, default attenuation factor of 0 0.03. That was based on their evaluation of a, of a database of, of sub-slab soil vapor samples from various sites around the country, which notably did not include any California sites. Um, put another way, um, a shift from 0 0.001 to 0 0.03 assumes that a much higher concentration of vapors is migrating into overlying structures from the subsurface. And that in turn results in a much more stringent screening level to establish that there is a presumptive lack of risk. Um, so after EPA acted, immediately California agencies began in turn to also default to the more conservative 0.3 attenuation factor value, which um, was finally and formally reflected in, in DTSC's draft 2020 guidance document, um, which after three more years of wrangling is still pending ongoing review and comments. So in response to the draft guidance document, um, you know, there's been a lot of attention by a lot of really high, highly qualified experts. Um, and so this, this is just but one example, but um, Robbie Ettinger and Matthew Lavis, a couple of, of leading experts in the VI field, um, they did a deep dive into the data profiles of over 100 VOC impaired sites in California, uh, mostly in um, the LA area and the San Francisco Bay area. What they found is... Um, at least in my opinion, quite compelling. These charts summarize the, the findings of, of the study by Labis and Enger. And obviously there's, there's a lot of technical detail here, but the key point is that their own statistical analysis of California empirical attenuation factors show results substantially lower than US EPA's 2015 study with the 95th, 95th percentile confidence level attenuation factors averaging 0 0.0027. Um, and, and really, you know, the upshot is that's a factor of, of approximately five to 30 times lower than EPA's 0 0.03 standard. Equally important, the 95th percentile confidence level for attenuation factors reporting reported in DTSC's own draft 2021 study of site-specific data are generally similar with, with the LNE study um, within a factor of roughly two um, to those results. So there's, there's clear consistency and overlap supporting a, a much less conservative attenuation value. So what has DTSC done in response to these findings? Unfortunately, not nearly enough. Uh, while DTSC's Human Health and Ecological Risk Office, um, or HERO, um, I'm not sure if that's aptly named or not, um, they, they have somewhat walked back 
from EPA's 0 0.03 attenuation factor with the, uh, the identified revisions here to its risk assessment notes three and four. Um, there has not been an express acknowledgement of the database evaluations and con or the conclusions by leading experts in the field, including within the DTSC itself, or that a significantly less stringent default attenuation factor would be more than adequately protective of health for screening purposes throughout California. Specifically, um, in terms of implications, the, the combined DTSC and l &E database indicate that attenuation factors in the range of 0 .00087 um, to 63, so we're adding another zero, in fact, would be um, more than protective of health for commercial industrial structures, um, even with less conservative values, um, with even less conservative numbers that would apply to residential structures because they typically have crawl spaces, et, et cetera. In the meantime, the current, right, the current approach and current state of affairs has been and remains a recipe for regulatory confusion. Um, as um, water board staff in particular and local agencies are not nearly as up to speed on these developments as the leadership of DTSC's cleanup unit. Um, so it's had very significant adverse implications for brownfield and in infill development across the state. So lawyers and clients that operate um, in this space should continue, and please do, to implore DTSC to adopt good science and common sense in the forthcoming and much anticipated final rendition of their revised uh, vapor intrusion guidance document. So we'll, we'll keep fingers crossed on that. So we'll now shift to a discussion of forever chemicals or PFAS. So there's been a lot of um, media attention focused on the topic over the last couple of years. What are they? What are PFAS? Um, it's an enormous body of synthetic chemicals that um, generally provide very useful applications to a broad swath of commercial and household products, but that have also created very serious and growing concerns in the United States and around the world about potential long-term impacts to human and animal health, as well as to the environment. Here are examples of, of just some of the many different and widely used consumer, commercial, and industrial products that use PFAS, which makes it challenging to study and assess the, the full extent of potential human health and environmental risks, um, just given the, the enormity of products that are involved. There's, there's also the, the problem that for some products, um, for example, like firefighting foams um, that are that are key for chemical fires, there aren't readily viable alternatives, uh, at least for now, that that work nearly as well. So, unfortunately, this is not a future or theoretical concern. These maps highlight what's already. Um, a very pervasive issue across the U.S. and within California, particularly Southern California drinking water sources. Um, and this is really despite the fact that um, broad testing for PFAS is, you know, it's is not well established, let alone required um, as a protocol for most industrial facilities. So, you know, this is this is an emerging chemical that we are, um, you know, in the process of learning a lot more about on an ongoing basis. In response to 
growing public concerns about PFAS, things are evolving very quickly at both the federal and state level. Two recently adopted federal laws provide over $11 billion in new funding to evaluate and address PFAS impacts across the United States. This includes remediation at military sites where use of fire retardant foams for training purposes was very common. Um, EPA is moving forward to establish federal drinking water standards for PFAS that will result in the establishment of maximum contaminant levels or MCLs, which in, in turn will provide a trigger for potential remedial actions at impaired sites. Um, but the last bullet may ultimately have the broadest implications, which is EPA's proposed listing of two PFOS chemicals, PFOA and PFOS as hazardous substances under CERCLA. Um, when, as expected, this eventually takes, a, takes effect, they're, they're aiming for this year, we'll see, there are all sorts of potential ramifications to the business community. Um, this includes facilities will be required to report on any releases of PFOA, PFOS, um, due diligence in real estate transactions will require um, an express evaluation of, of PFAS uh, potential impacts. Um, there's the, the significant possibility of new enforcement um, or reopeners at closed Superfund or state cleanup sites by regulatory agencies, whether uh, state, federal or state or local. And um, also new cost recovery and property damage litigation initiated either by agencies or private parties to address PFAS impacts. Not surprisingly, things are quickly advancing in California as well. New laws adopted last year seek to ban or phase out PFAS in consumer products, um, including PPE and waterproof sports gear. California, through via the Attorney General's office, has filed a groundbreaking lawsuit against 18 PFOS manufacturers seeking a broad array of damages, corrective measures, um, other relief to address environmental impacts from PFOS. Um, and finally, much like EPA is moving forward with setting federal drinking water standards for PFOS, California is doing the same. Uh, currently, the Office of Environmental Health Hazards Assessments, or OEHA, is preparing draft public health goals or PHGs for PFOA and PFOS. Those are expected to go public this year. Um, and just as a reminder, PHGs represent the amount of a chemical in drinking water at which even based on a, a lifetime of exposure, no adverse health effects um, would be expected. They're not enforceable regulatory standards, but they they establish the basis for the state board to in turn adopt MCLs for these constituents, which are required to be as, as close as possible to the PHGs while accounting for costs and, and technical feasibility. Um, there will be a great deal of interest within the California regulatory community in this MCL timeline and evaluative process, given the very widespread implications for water purveyors and potential sources of PFAS contamination to groundwater. So lawyers and consultants operating in the PFAS space believe that these ongoing developments are a big deal. Um, how big is still to be determined and will certainly be shaped, at least in part, by regulatory capacity and efficiency, especially here in California. Um, but to put the challenges ahead in some context, I would direct you to the second bullet um, entitled Drinking Water Standards. Typical federal and California MCLs for common contaminants like 
PCE or TCE are in the parts per billion. Um, so imagine a, a thimble of product getting dumped into an Olympic-sized swimming pool. EPA's proposed PHG for PFOA and PFOS is in the parts per quadrillion. Um, that's 15 zeros. I, I had to look that one up. Uh, that's a lot. You know, so our, our ability to reliably test, let alone economically um, evaluate and remediate at those um, infinitesimally minute levels it, it presents some very significant challenges. Um, last point, there's there's a, a, a really significant uh, practical aspect to all this, another practical aspect to this as well. Our clients routinely bracket environmental liability risk with environmental insurance or pollution legal liability products. However, insurers are already carving out and excluding coverage for PFAS cleanup costs and limiting coverage in some instances for third-party property damage claims arising from known or unknown PFAS contamination. Um, already, this is making deals on properties with a known or potential PFAS profile more complicated. Um, and we don't expect this situation to improve, unfortunately, over time. So I'm going to um, going to to, to touch um, somewhat briefly on the the latest iteration of the construction stormwater general permit. Um, it's got a long formal name, but um, more colloquially colloquially referred to as the CGP. Um, the prior permit was um, adopted back in, in 2010. It was subject to extensive legal challenges, um, formally implemented, I believe, in, in 2012. So the, the new, they're, they're supposed to, the state board is required to update and revise the CGP every five years, was supposed to have occurred in 2015. Um, it was an an ongoing process that culminated with formal adoption in uh, September of 2022. Um, the new permit requirements will formally take effect September 1, 2023, and continue for a five-year period. So the, 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 the heart and essence of CGP compliance provides that if you are developing a site one acre or greater in size, um, or if if the project is, um, if, if it's less than one acre, but part of a larger common plan of development, you need to hire an environmental consultant to prepare a stormwater pollution prevention plan, advise you on all the sampling and analysis requirements, advise you on BMP or best management practices implementation, so that you can ensure um, that you are preventing pollutant discharges from the development site, including sediment. In terms of compliance requirements, believe it or not, there's actually some good news to report on. Um, as initially proposed by state board staff, they wanted to include numeric effluent limits for all 69 TMDLs or total maximum daily load constituents identified in water bodies throughout California. Um, there was a tremendous um, push by the, by the construction and building industry, including, you know, up to and including the date of the, the final hearing. Um, and, and those efforts were uh, largely successful. Um, in the final permit, the only NELs that will go into effect apply to four specific lakes in the LA area. 
um, was deal with pesticide compounds. And even there, the state board included a reopener for, for those numeric effluent limits, um, along with uh, required updates before next year. Um, so the, uh, the, the compliance mechanisms remain um, based on um, action levels and sampling and you know, based based on observed detections of specified pollutants, um, it's still uh, a BMP and it, an iterative based approach, um, much like it's it's been in prior iterations. From from a legal perspective, there are many compelling arguments, and and they've certainly been repeatedly voiced in a variety of contexts as to why. Um, numeric effluent limits or NELs should not be included in, in the CGP. Um, in fact, California courts have repeatedly upheld the state board's interpretation that the Clean Water Act does not require um, NIPTES permits to include numer numeric limits. Um, it, you know, on top of or in addition to BMPs. And that's even when the permit is intended to uh, to achieve numeric water quality standards. Um, and in fact, federal courts have also reached the same conclusion. Um, and the relevance of this is that while, while BMPs for construction sites have clearly been proven to improve water quality for a wide range of, of pollutants, and that's you can you can see some of those reflected here in in the the chart on the the bottom right. Um, there there is correspond there's no corresponding evidence that BMPs can meet numeric effluent limits um, or even numeric action levels that the water the state board has been advocating for many many years. Um, and so where you know where this is all potentially headed and the pushback is to um, try to, to defer or avoid advanced treatment systems or ATS to address stormwater pollutants. Um, needless to say, if, if and when required, they are um, significantly more costly to implement at construction sites than the existing BMP paradigm. Okay, well, last but not least, the third rail of development law, um, a very brief CEQA housing update. So full disclosure, I am not a CEQA lawyer and don't even dabble in it. My, my colleagues here at Greenberg, um, they, they do the, the heavy lifting on any of our CEQA issues. Um, but I found a recent report prepared by the Center for Jobs and the Economy and the California Business Roundtable to be very compelling. Um, and, and also the fact that it, it has been accompanied by um, you know, what I would characterize as mildly encouraging media coverage uh, to go along with it. So this was... Um, a CEQA report, as I mentioned, um, prepared by the Center for Jobs and the Economy. And, you know, this, it, it won't come as any surprise to, to those of you involved with mixed use or multi-family residential development, but um, CEQA litigation based on this um, in-depth evaluation of projects approved and lawsuits filed over the last seven years is having a far worse dampening effect on new housing starts in California than has been reported by key California agencies. Um, and that includes statistics that, it, that were cited in, um, in CARB's current scoping plan. Um, and so just, you know, just to kind of walk through some of these key stats, um, approximately 40% of, of new homes approved um, for development in California have been subject to challenge by CEQA lawsuits, often citing um, um, inadequate uh, 
climate change or GHG analyses, despite over 80 new laws that have been passed by the California legislature since 2015 to address the state's housing crisis, new housing starts remain flat. Um, we're averaging a little over 100,000 new homes per year over the last six years. Um, and this is in the face of, the, of at least um, the governor's goal of 350,000 um, new homes per year. And, and this, you know, this has had as detailed in the report, and I would encourage you to read it, um, you know, this has some real um, meaningful implications for a lot of um, underserved communities, workers that have that are having to commute um, ever greater distances into urban cores, et cetera. And, and finally, the, the number of annual sequel lawsuits um, challenging housing approvals continues to grow with um, almost 50,000 housing units targeted by lawsuits alone in 2020. Um, so I, I, found, I found that these stats were rather astounding, but I'll, I'll conclude with, with reference to the report's uh, provocative final paragraph and quote that California's hardworking families continue to fall victim to sequel lawsuits you know, filed in, in the name of the environment. Um, so, you know, a, a lot of work to be done there. And um, interestingly, and just as a final note, even progressive mainstream media outlets um, seem to be more directly acknowledging the problem. Um, the LA Times just yesterday um, posted the following editorial criticizing challenges to proposed new student housing in Berkeley. Um, however, and suffice to say, the compelling need for significant CEQA reform continues. So with that, I will um, wrap things up with another mention of, of, our, of, of the key housekeeping item, at least for the lawyers that are participating uh, today. Um, you can get linked to your CLE credit materials in the chat box, and you'll also be receiving an email with same. And I will now um, reserve remaining time for, for questions. And let me see if I can actually uh, get into the, the Q&A chat here to see if, if there are any any additional questions? Um, okay, so I see first question from um, longtime friend and, and, and colleague in, in the Brownfield community, Matt Weinfield. He asks, are there any legal tools available to compel Cal EPA to use the DTSC and the the Lavin Ettinger studies um, with respect to the attenuation factors. Um, that's a good question, Matt. I, you know, I don't, I don't know specifically what, you know, what, what either the mechanism or the timing for any any legal challenge would be based on the fact that this this is draft guidance. It's not a binding decision document. And so, you know, it's, I think it's still um, just as a matter of administrative pr procedure viewed as an ongoing concern where public feedback is being solicited. Um, you know, once, once the revised final vapor intrusion guidance document is promulgated, um, there, you know, there there are avenues for administrative challenges. I don't know how it would specifically apply in that context, um, but you know the I, and I know you have been in particular very actively involved in in this ongoing discussion and lobbying effort, and that you know that that needs to continue to happen. the The development community, the construction industry needs to to really. Um, Put its shoulder behind that initiative and and continue to implore DTSC to to take a, a harder look at that information. If you have any, if there's any other questions, feel free to to drop them into 
the Q and A box. Um, there was a question as to whether or not we will be be distributing the slides. Um, the answer is yes. Um, if that's if that has not already been done, so that will also be included in in the email. Okay. Well, I wish I could uh, see all see all of you in person, but hopefully this has been helpful, at least somewhat informative. Um, well, with not seeing any other questions, we'll go ahead and, and wrap things up. Thank you very much. And uh, should you have any any other questions that come to mind, feel free to reach out either either to myself, other members of our team here at Greenberg, um, or or council that you um, currently work with. There's you know there's we've we've peeled back one layer to the onion. There's there's a lot more here. So with that, good morning. Thank you very much, and we'll uh, we'll look forward to seeing you.